Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. We are in 1 Samuel chapter number 13 this evening, and uh, we had such a wonderful look at Saul over the last few weeks. I have enjoyed this little brief time that we have had of Saul being a very good king. But the bad news is, well, what we know is coming is here. He's going to start making some bad decisions. He's going to start going down a road, making him uh, the first king, not a good king, but a bad king in the history of Israel. But you know, bad kings don't just happen they make a process to get to that place. And when we get to a place in our Christian life where we are doing, quote-unquote, bad things, it doesn't just happen. There's a process that takes us to that place. And there's something that's very pivotal that happens in Samuel's, or rather Saul's life this evening that I think will be instructive for us to help us not go down the same path. And the title of my message is this, and I mentioned it this morning, I've Got My Reasons. I've got my reasons. Now, as a pastor, there are times I talk with people about difficulties that they're having in their life or struggles that I can perceive that they're having, and I want to come to them in a non-confrontational manner in the sense that I'm not trying to attack them, but at the same time, I do want to let them know as their spiritual advisor, their spiritual guide, that I see some things in their life that might not be according to what the Word of God says and in a loving and kind way, but yet... As the leader that God has placed in their life, I feel like there's some things I need to bring to their attention. And oftentimes, when I talk to people about this path they're taking, they will say something like this to me. Well, pastor, I've got my reasons. I've got my reasons. And they almost throw that down as kind of like the trump card that cannot be topped when you say, I have my reasons. And it's, it means that in a couple different ways. First of all, it's kind of like, this is my final point. There's nothing else to talk about. Like, I have my reasons. There's nothing else that I'm going to present to you. I'm not even going to present to you the reasons. I'm just going to tell you I have my reasons. This is my final point. And it's almost, as in a way, a dismissal. Kind of saying, Pastor, it's not really your business. It's not something I want to talk to you about. I have my reasons. Sometimes even people say, well, it's between me and God. You know, God knows my reasons. These are kind of variations of things that people will say. In fact, about a month ago, someone had texted me something, not someone who's here, but said something. They said, God knows my reasons. And I said, well, that's true. And I texted back. I said, God does know your reasons, but that doesn't mean that God agrees with your reasons. I wasn't trying to be rude or unkind about it, but I did want to make plain that just because we have reasons doesn't mean they aren't good reasons. And tonight, Saul is going to trot out this line, in essence, to none other than Samuel. Remember, Samuel, we thought he passed off the scene last week. But it seems like God still has more work for him to do. Remember, we talked about that in conclusion last week. That we thought, as Samuel thought that he was done with what God has for him. But because he aged gracefully, God was going to continue to use him far beyond what Samuel thought he could be used of God. And so Samuel is going to lovingly confront Saul about some sin in his life. And Saul, instead of taking the rebuke the way he should have, instead of taking the correction with humility... He basically looked at Samuel and said, mind your own business, I have my reasons. And what I want us to see tonight from the Word of God, and this is so important for us to learn and to realize, that our reasons never overrule God's revealed Word. Whatever reasons we have, quote unquote, to live our life, they never can overrule God's revealed Word in our life. Well, we are in 1 Samuel 13, so if you would stand for the reading of the Word of God tonight, 1 Samuel chapter number 13. And we'll begin in verse number one in just a moment. And it says this, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan... By the way, this is the first mention of Jonathan, the son of Saul. We'll see a lot of good things about him, won't we? And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines. 
and that Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And by the way, you don't have to be a military historian or even a biblical historian to understand that is a huge amount of people they're going to battle with. An absolutely enormous amount of people that the Philistines are pushing into battle against the Israelites. And it says, And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from beth Avon. And the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. And that's important, and we'll look at that in a moment. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Now, without getting into preaching the message this moment, we understand this is a problem. Is Samuel, or rather Saul, supposed to be someone who's offering a burnt offering? The answer is no. He's of the tribe of Benjamin, and that was to be done exclusively by the tribe of Levi, of which Samuel was a part of. So we can just put it this way, Saul is in sin. Saul has made a sinful decision here because of what he saw as the circumstances that he was in that gave him no choice but to make this decision. Verse 10, And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and thou camest not within the days appointed, and the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and made a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. Those are important words. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And Samuel arose and gat him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. So Samuel comes and rebukes Saul. Saul is against an innumerable host with 600 men. And he doesn't know what to do, but he ends up making the wrong decision. When called upon it, he does not have a heart that is after God, but a heart that's only after self-preservation of his leadership. And we'll look at why all of this matters to us here tonight in just a moment as you're seated, and then we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this night, and thank you that we're able to get back in your word. And I pray that you would just bless as we look at these issues and help me to be able to say rightly what you would have for these people tonight, those who are here, those who are listening and watching. I pray that what I say is right and spirit-led, and that you would help all of us to deal with this issue of being right before you and being right before ourselves, making sure that we're honest uh, in our own hearts about the own issues of life that we deal with. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our text opens this evening in verse number one with Saul having reigned two years. It says, well, that he reigned one year and then two years over Israel. And there's some thought about why that verse is phrased in the way that it is, but I would give you the thought that really it seemed to come down to the fact that you'll remember that he was crowned and then later on was coronated. And so it does seem like there was this time that had passed between from his crowning and then his coronation and all that took place with Samuel. And now two years total has eclipsed. And it says that in verse two, he chose 3,000 men of Israel to be his soldiers. This is actually a very interesting thing because it's the first time we see in Israel's history that they have a standing army. Before that, they had always had a militia-based system, meaning this, when there was a call to arms, any of the men who are able-bodied from age 20 to age 50, with just a few exceptions that were lined out in the law of Moses, they would all go out to battle together. 
But now Samuel, or rather Saul, I'm going to be glad when I stop saying Samuel for Saul and Saul for Samuel. We'll get there eventually. But Saul ends up moving to a more army-based uh, 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 form of defense where now he is choosing men who will make up a standing army for him. And you'll remember that it was in the last chapter we saw that he went to battle with 330,000 militia men. But now he has mustered a uh, professional group, uh, a professional soldiers of 3,000 men. That's a far cry from the 330,000 that he had before. But it ends up that Jonathan takes his detachment of men, about a thousand of them, and goes, and in many ways, it seems like he pokes the bear of the Philistines. I'm not saying that he does anything wrong. Jonathan is a valiant man, and we're going to see so at the end of this chapter and into the following chapter as well. But Jonathan valiantly goes and fights the Philistines, and by the way, he wins. But he pokes the bear, and the bear awakens. The Philistines don't really have as much of a problem with Israel. They're still over the people of Israel to a point, and they just don't have a problem with them because they're subservient. In fact, later on in the chapter, we find out they're so subservient that the Israelites don't even have men to be able to do metallurgy for them, to be able to create swords and, and, and uh, implements of war. And they were so beaten down and broken down, the Israelites were, that the Philistines kind of were of the opinion, we don't even need to do anything to them because they're not going to harm us. Well, Jonathan awakens them to the fact that they are, well, Israel's back on the move again. And what I find interesting about Saul, because remember, Saul's been pretty humble up to this point, but we start to see the seeds of Saul changing in his heart. Because who was the one that made this great victory? Well, verse number three tells us it was Jonathan that smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. But look at what happens next. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that who? Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines. Now let me ask you, who was the one that smote the garrison of the Philistines? It was Jonathan. Now, if we think ahead in our minds about Saul a little bit, would there ever be a time that Saul would become a little bit maybe jealous or protective of his legacy compared to someone else who seemed to be fighting more valiantly than him? The answer is yes. There's going to be a time when David will have slain his tens of thousands and Saul has only slain his thousands and Saul can't handle that. Well, it seems like the seeds of some of that may be starting right here where Jonathan gets the victory and Saul blows the trumpet and all of Israel somehow gets the message that Saul is the one that gets the victory. And that's not what had happened. So we already start to see maybe a little bit of a change of heart here in Saul, right here in verse number four. But it goes on and it says, the Philistines gather themselves together with 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people which were innumerable. Now, Again, we have to get into our mind, this is an incredible host, 30,000 chariots. In fact, I've read commentaries even just this week that put doubt on the word of God that it was maybe a mistake in the, the Hebrew, that it really wasn't 30,000, it was probably more 3,000 or something like that. It would be very easy for there to be a mistake in the word of God in that way. But I'm just simple enough and I'm just plain enough that if the Bible says there were 30,000 chariots, you weren't there, I wasn't there, those commentators sure weren't there. I just wanna take the word of God, well, at its word. And if it says there's 30,000, I have no reason to doubt that. And there would be some that say, well, it's just not possible that the Philistines could possibly muster together 30,000 chariots to go to battle. And I'd say, well, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's possible that the Red Sea could open. It doesn't seem like it's possible. A lot of things that we find in the Word of God that God has preserved for us in His Word. I just want to take it at its word for what it says. And so we see that there's a big host. Well, there's a big host here, and it doesn't seem like there's a reason to doubt that that's the case. And it says when Israel saw this, listen, they were distressed. They obviously saw a very big group and it bothered them how big the group was. And they were not as valiant as Jonathan was. What are they doing? They're hiding. They're going every which direction trying to find a place to go. Some were trying to find a hideout. They were going in caves and under rocks and in high places and in pits. Some just dropped out. They just ran away. It says in verse number seven that some went to the land of Gad and to Gilead. You realize that's on the other side of the Jordan River. They were going to the east, the Jordan River, and they just kept right on running. Some were trying to find a hideout. Some dropped out. And we find out as we go down to verse number eight and beyond that some would hold out. That they were just saying, I don't think I want to go to battle. I'm with Saul here, but I don't know that I want to stay. And so what we end up seeing is a process that by the end of the text, we go from 330,000 that were fighting a couple chapters ago 
to a 3,000 man standing army to by the time they're about to go to battle, there's only 600 men left. Now listen, 600 is twice as much that Gideon needed to be able to beat the Midianites back in the book of Judges. Because it's really not about the number, it's about the God of the number. But Saul forgot all of this, and Saul was not aware of this. Well, he was aware of this, but was being ignorant of this fact in this very moment. And so he starts to understand that there is going to, uh, there, there needs to be something done because he's losing men, he is losing his standing army, and, and guys are dropping out, they're hiding out, they're holding out. What am I going to do? And he realizes, I need to unify these men together to show my power. I need to unify these men to show that I'm in charge and I'm in control. And so what he knows needs to be done is that a sacrifice needs to be made. There's only one problem. Samuel's the one who makes the sacrifices and Samuel hadn't shown up. Samuel's the one who's supposed to take that sacrifice and give it before the Lord and to present the people to battle, but Samuel's nowhere to be found. And look again at what it says in verse number eight. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. Now, we may ask ourselves, well, when did Samuel set a time for Saul to wait for him? Well, if we go back to chapter 10, which why don't you just put your place here and go back to chapter 10, just a couple pages away. And verse number eight, You go up to verse number seven, it says this, And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings, and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee, and show thee what thou shalt do. Now this was probably two years before when Samuel told him this. But he was telling him some signs that were going to come to pass. And he says, when they come to pass, there's something else I also want you to remember. There's something I just want you to put in the back of your mind. There's going to come a time at Gilgal where there's going to be a battle and a sacrifice is going to need to be made. You're going to need to wait seven days and then I will be there and then I'll make the sacrifice. But what happens? Saul is waiting. It's one day, two day, three days. And he has men coming up to him and saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to win? Guys are leaving. My, the captain of my battalion has gone. What are we going to do, Saul? I, I thought we had this big group of guys. I mean, 3,000 choice men, and it seems like we're down to hundreds now. What are we going to do? And as day goes by day, and all this wears down upon Saul, he gets to the point where he realizes, I have to do something. I have to take control. And I will tell you, this is the most human and normal of all of the things that we deal with as people. This idea of, I cannot just have faith and wait. I've got to do something. I mean, does anyone else deal with this or is it just me? How often is it the fact that we know we need to rest upon the promises of God, but resting seems like waiting and waiting seems uncomfortable. But there's something I can do. And so I might as well do the thing, whether it's right or not, because at least I'm doing something. But that's the opposite of faith. That's operating by sight. And this is what Saul's doing. And I understand he's in a difficult position, but he's a leader. He's supposed to be a leader of men. And what he is doing here is just giving in to the pressure of those who are around him. And by day seven, he says, bring me the sacrifice. I am going to sacrifice this sacrifice myself. And he does so. And did you, did you see what it said in verse number 10? It says, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the bird offering, behold, Samuel came. It was almost as if he is done and he says amen and Samuel comes around the corner. All he had to do was wait another 30 minutes. Remember, Samuel said, seven days I'll be there. It's day seven. All he had to do was wait a little bit longer, but he refused to wait. And what ended up happening was Samuel showed up and confronted him. Now, this is serious on a couple hands. One, Saul was told to wait, and he did not wait. And secondly, Saul was not able to give the offering. You'll remember that in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, King Uzziah tried to do the same thing. King Uzziah was a good king, and he attempted, because of the haughtiness of his heart, to offer a sacrifice. And the Bible says that as he did so, the leprosy went up his arm and throughout his whole body. God takes a dim view of those who were trying to usurp the position of the priests 
of the tribe of Levi. That was true whether it was the first king in Saul. That's true if it was later on the divided kingdom with Uzziah. So he has made a bad choice for two different reasons. One, because he's transgressed the law of the Levites and because he has not listened to the revealed word of God given to him by Samuel. And when Samuel spoke to him, he was speaking to him the word of God. We know that because Samuel was speaking to him things that were revelatory, things that could have only come from God. Samuel couldn't have known these things that were going on that he prophesied before chapter 10 verse 8 and certainly he wouldn't have known in and of himself that in two years there was going to be this issue at Gilgal and that I was going to be there but I was going to have to wait seven days. Only God could have given him that. So he transgressed against the law that was written and he transgressed against the law that was spoken to him through Samuel from God. But this is where the rubber hits the road. And this is where we get to maybe the most illuminating part about Saul's heart. And sadly, one of the most pathetic parts about Saul's heart. And I say pathetic not because I, I, I want to cast aspersions on him tonight, but I, I say that word pathetic quite literally. Uh, the definition of pathetic means miserably inadequate of a very low standard. And we're going to find that Saul's heart is miserably inadequate. It's of a very low standard. You know, one of the things that we've seen about Saul so far that has made him look like a good king is that everything's gone his way. You know, nothing's really gone against him so far, has it? There's been difficulty. The people rose up to the occasion because of the difficulty. And because of that, he's shown good character. But I've often found the case is that people's character is not truly revealed until they don't get what they want. And people's character is often not truly revealed until they're rebuked. Because then you find out what's truly in the heart, how they respond to not getting what they want, how they respond to being rebuked according to the word of God. And so here comes Samuel. The minute he's done with the offering, and I love what Samuel says. All he says is, what hast thou done? What are you doing? What are you thinking? And immediately, Saul starts playing the blame game. And he blames three different people or groups of people. First of all, look at verse number 11. Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me. So what is he saying? It's the people's fault. I would have done it if the people weren't leaving. What else? And that thou camest not within the days appointed. So who else's fault is it? Samuel, it's your fault. If you had come earlier, I wouldn't have had to do this. And then he goes on and says, and, thou, and, and that the Philistines gather themselves together at Michmash. So it's the Philistines' fault. So what does he do? He says, look, don't get on my case. It's the people's fault. It's the Philistines' fault. And Samuel, you need to be honest with yourself. It's your fault too. If these situations hadn't happened the way that they did, I wouldn't have done it. But I, did you catch what he says? I forced myself. I didn't want to do it. I want to know part of this. I, I, I did not want to transgress against the Lord, but I just had to force myself to do it because someone had to make a decision. Someone had to be a leader. Someone had to stand up and say, we're going to do this for the Lord. And it seemed like he was doing it for the Lord. I mean, after all, he was offering an offering to God. It wasn't like he was offering an offering to Baal. It wasn't like he was offering an offering to Ashtaroth. He was still offering an offering to God. So, I mean, look, Samuel, look, I had my reasons. I did what I needed to do. And this is where we see Saul's downfall begin. And you can point to this very moment, as well as a very similar moment that we're going to find in chapter 15, and make a direct beeline and understand where the downfall began. Because we can make a comparison here tonight between Saul and David. You know, David is called a man after God's own heart. I didn't call him that. The Lord called him this. In his word, we find that he's a man after God's own heart. I mean, I don't want to run David down here tonight, but David did some pretty bad stuff. I mean, he married multiple women. He took a woman that did not belong to him and murdered her husband. He counted the people, even though he shouldn't have and was told not to. He didn't act in an appropriate way many times with Absalom and Amnon and Tamar and the whole issue that took place there and how he allowed 
unrighteousness to reign unchecked throughout his family. There's a lot you can look at in David's life and say, I don't get this man after God's own heart thing. But here's what I know. Every time someone came to David and spoke to him and said, you've done wrong. You know what he said? I've done wrong. Nathan looks at him and says, thou art the man. He says, I am the man. Joab tells him, you shouldn't count the people. He says, I told you to count the people. And then the angel of death comes. And what does he do? He lays himself out before him and is willing to give himself up because he realizes his people are paying the price because of his own sin. Over and over and over again, we see that when David is rebuked, we find that he accepts rebuke. And he doesn't say, I had my reasons. He says, I had no reason to disobey. And because of that, we look at David as a man after God's own heart. And here is Saul, who Samuel comes to him and asks him a very simple question. What are you doing? And he says, look, <laughs> this is not my fault. I didn't want to do it. They made me do it. In fact, they made me do it. The Philistines made me do it. In fact, Samuel, you made me do it because if you had come on time, I wouldn't have had to do it. And Samuel or Saul does what? Stone walls. And he refuses rebuke. He refuses correction. In his pride, he says, I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, amongst Orthodox believers, and by Orthodox, I, I mean those who believe the truths of the Word of God as they have been commonly preached throughout history. Among Orthodox believers, there's a clear understanding that biblical revelation has ceased. Meaning this, we're not getting any more of this. Revelation tells us, don't add to it, don't subtract from it. That if someone says, I have a new word of prophecy that is to be added to Scripture, we can say, according to the Word of God, no, you don't. No, you don't. And I believe here tonight, as I look at this group of people who's here, we would agree with that. We would understand that. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13 teaches, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When that which is perfect, the preaching of the Word of God, the, the perfect Word of God, rather, not the preaching of the Word of God, the Word of God that we have is perfect, that we don't need any of those things that were given in the Old Testament, even the beginning of the New Testament, the signs, the visions, those kind of things. Those were just to authenticate the preachers so you know who is preaching rightly? Now you know how to authenticate the preacher? You go home after church and check this. That's, that's what we have now. But nobody in this assembly, I believe, would be so bold to say, you know what? God has given me new, fresh revelation that brings new instruction from the Word of God. I mean, I don't think anybody here tonight would say, you know what, Pastor, I've got a new word, and it's different from the old word, and if you could let me say it to everybody, I want everyone to know what God wants us to know now in this day. Nobody here would say that. But here's the problem. That when it found, comes oftentimes to the revealed word being preached, there are many Christians who believe they have received an extra word about their situation. Well, pastor, I know what the word of God says, but stop right there. Because whatever comes after that puts yourself in a very dangerous situation. Because when you start to say that your situation merits a very specific and very special exception to the Word of God, what you are saying is you have something that it provides more clarity that you have received than what the Word of God has. And friend, that's a very difficult place to be. That's a very dangerous place to be. Now, none of us would actually say that out loud. But that's really what is implied when we say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I have a reason. Here's Saul. Well, I know. Samuel, I know what you wanted me to do, but look, the people were leaving. They were, we're about to get conquered. Israel was about to, to be destroyed. What did you want me to do? And Samuel rightly said, what I wanted you to do was obey. In fact, in chapter 15, we're going to find that obedience is better than sacrifice. And to hearken is better than the fat of rams. God doesn't need the sacrifice. God didn't need that animal. What God needed was a leader who was willing to lead, thus saith the Lord. 
And that's why he says in verse number 13, Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. He says, but verse 14, the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And I can tell you on the authority of the word, any reason that we give for disobeying the word of God, no matter how reasonable or heartfelt it may seem, it is nothing but an excuse. And I'm afraid that sometimes as Christians, we have carved out exceptions to what the Bible says about our situations. And when we do so, we put ourselves on a very dangerous road like Saul, because when you can start questioning the word of God, how it applies to you in this area, you can start to question how it applies to you in a lot of other different areas of your life. And all of a sudden you're doing things that you never thought was possible. And you think you're doing it all with God's blessing. But unless God has given you an extra word, which he hasn't, then we have to just obey what the word of God says and trust that resting upon his word is always the right way to go. Well, pastor, I have my reasons. Well, I hear that a lot. We talked just over the last few weeks about tithing. You say, oh, pastor, here we go about tithing again. I know, one more time, all right? One more time. I think it was, it, was, uh, it was illustrated to us by Marcia's testimony about some great difficulty she was having in her life. And she says, but I realized that I needed to tithe. And God brought her out of those situations because of faithfulness to what the Lord had already revealed in his word. But when we say, well, I would tithe, but my situation is such, what we're implying is that we have more wisdom than the God of the universe who put all of this into place in the first place. And there's a whole host of people would say here, you know what, when I started tithing, I probably wasn't independently wealthy. I think that's probably all of our testimonies here. But we just trusted the Lord and realized, wow, I'm glad I didn't make myself the exception because I would have lost out on what God has already told me to do. And so there are some that won't tithe or refuse to tithe. Can I tell you, you're not the exception and your reason is not a biblical reason. Say, Pastor, you're, are you upset about this? No, I'm not. I'm just saying it's just one of many examples we can give where it's very easy to tell ourselves, well, in my situation, you know, once I get out of debt or once I get this new job or once I switch jobs or once we pay down our house a little bit or once we have this taken care of and once and once and once and once, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, ends up being never. Trust the Lord. Trust him and he will bring you through. Well, you know, I don't really walk with God the way I want to right now, but I'm going to get there. You know what? Next year, I'm going to get there. Well, why not just start tomorrow? Well, I got some things going on personally right now, but, I, you know, once I get through those, you know, God wants you, especially in this time, when you've got some things personally going on, to walk closely with Him. Well, you know, I, I really want to start having a prayer life. I'm really going to start doing that, you know, in the coming year. But it's July. That's why I hate New Year's resolutions. Because you get to August, September, you're like, ah, I'll wait till next year. Like, why do we need it? Imagine the head start we'd have if we started certain things in September. We get into January feeling great. But oftentimes, like dieting, well, you know, it's July and uh, we've got cookouts in August and uh, Halloween candy and Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, well, then January, we had all that. I'll start in February, but then there's Valentine's Day candy too. And we know what ends up happening? We have our reasons but we don't end up doing what God wants us to do. And that's kind of a silly illustration, but it illustrates a spiritual truth that we put off some very important things until later. There's no good reason, well, there's no good reason to avoid using good language. Well, pastor, you know, the language I use, I'm just around some rough people and I've got to be rough too. No, you need to be salt and light. Yeah, we're not trying to fit in, we're trying to stand out for Jesus. And so you may have a reason to act in a certain way, but that's not, that doesn't mean that's something that God endorses. Let, let's, get, let's get real here for a minute. Some bitterness, some forgiveness that needs to be extended. Pastor, you don't know what they did to me, and, and I don't. I don't know the situations of your life that you've gone through. But it's been said before that forgiveness is realizing that you need to release a prisoner and that that prisoner is you. 
And oftentimes the forgiveness that we need to extend has a lot more to do with us than it does the other person. Again, I'm not saying that we end up restoring someone to a place that they don't deserve. We don't forgive a thief and then make them a bank teller. You understand what I'm saying tonight? What I am saying is this. There could be some hurt or bitterness that you're harboring in your heart. And pastor, if you only knew what I went through, you wouldn't be saying what you were saying. Listen, I'm saying it because I love you, but Jesus knows what you've been through. And he wants you to extend forgiveness for your own sake. Again, that doesn't mean that person becomes a close confidant or someone that's trusted with you again. They could have done something that would cause that trust to be revoked, and I understand that. But forgiveness can still be offered, even if it's just in your heart. Maybe you can't extend it. Maybe they've passed on. Maybe it's someone that you can't even converse with anymore. But pastor, I have my reasons. Listen, God loves you so much, he doesn't want you to have a reason other than to say, I need to forgive them. This is kind of one of those messages that's really great until we find a place until it applies to our life. And then we don't like it as much because <laughs> we all have a place. We all have this area of our life that we've kind of held back from the Lord because we have our reasons. And he says this, I want you to give it all to me. You haven't got an extra word. You haven't got extra biblical prophecy given to you. We have these 66 books that are sufficient for everything we need that pertains to life and godliness, the Bible says. Allow it to work in your life. Allow God to do what only he can do in your life. Saul did not, and he started down a very bad path that we can point back to chapter number 13. I'll tell you this and we'll be done. I have learned in 11, almost 11, 12 years living here in New England, um, the best ways to drive into Boston and not to drive into Boston. Actually, I've learned the best way to drive into Boston is not to drive into Boston. That's really the best way. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, what, what are you going to do? There are some days that's just the case. Um, I always put where I'm going to Boston, the GPS, even though especially if I'm going to the hospital or something like that, I already know where I'm going. But I put it in because I like to check the traffic. I like to know what's out there. And you know that if you've gone up 24 over to 93, that really about 5.30, rush hour starts about 5.30. The cars start stacking up that early. But I love putting it into the GPS like I did just a few days ago. And I love to see the weird ways it tries to take me into Boston other than going up 24. Sometimes it'll tell me, go, go up 138 all the way through Milton and then all the way up into, you know, uh, uh, you know, Roxbury and all of that, you know, just take 138 all the way up. It only take you an hour and a half, but you can do that. Uh, there are times it tells me to go up 24 and then head over to 28 and then jog off a of 28 north past the Blue Hills and, and to do that. I've seen that and then pop out and Milton out on 93. There's all kinds of ways that it's told me to go. Sometimes it just tells you, hey, you know what, go up around 93, uh, 95 the other direction and then cut around 90 and then go into Boston from the east side, which is its own level of misery on top of the fact you have to pay for that kind of misery on top of it. So it tells me all these different ways. But there's one thing that I always know that the GPS doesn't know. There's one thing that I have on top of the GPS. It doesn't matter how good that it is that I know that it doesn't know. That if I've got two people in my car, I can take the HOV lane. And it never accounts for the HOV lane. And one of, one of the most pleasurable things in my life, and you say, Pastor, you have a pretty sad life. Listen, just leave me alone. One of the most pleasurable things in my life is to drive up towards Boston and it see it's an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And you go in that HOV lane and you watch that time go down. It's, you know, it's 50 minutes, it's 40 minutes, it's 30 minutes. And it's just going down. I'll tell you, it's a good feeling. It, you know why? Because I've, I've outsmarted the system. The system thought it knew. But I knew better. And it feels good when I end up getting into Boston about 50 or so minutes. Every once in a while, I found that the HOV lane is actually slower than the regular traffic, which is a little bit weird. But on the whole, I have found that I outsmart the GPS when it comes to going to Boston. You know why? Learned experience. I've lived a little. I've lived here long enough that I've learned a few things. You know what I found is true for Christians? We allow our, quote, learned experience. Remember we talked about this last week with aging gracefully? We allow our learned experience to sometimes draw us to wrong conclusions. And we start to think, well, I've seen a few things. And because of what I've seen, I'm going to act in this manner. The problem is, is that when we relate that to going against a GPS, you know, the GPS doesn't know everything. 
the GPS is fallible. When we talk about our relationship with God, we're not going to outsmart God. We don't know a corner that God does not know about. He created the corners. He created the roads. He created the computers. He created all of it. There is nothing that we can do that can go around and circumvent what God has put in his word and that we can be better off. And I'm afraid too many times as Christians, we get a GPS mentality where, you know, it's a suggestion, but I know better about the word of God. And that is a very dangerous place to be. This is not just your handy helper. This is not a way to avoid some of the traffic of life. It is the word of God to live by. It is the word of God to obey. And it is the word of God that does not make mistakes. No matter how good your reasons are, and no matter how good my reasons are, they're typically just excuses. When God says to do it, we do it. And when we do our own thing, we put ourselves on a very bad path that Saul will end up finding out leads to his ultimate death because he refused to listen to God. Our reasons never overrule God's revealed word. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in his word.